This is episode number eight with Frank McKinney. So let's go, 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 I follow, oh, oh, wherever you go, cause you're... Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of The Invention Show, a podcast about all things invention and reinvention, where entrepreneurs, influencers, artists, and authorities in the field today share their story of triumphs and challenges in both life and business. My name is Tak Lee entrepreneur, international property investor, inventor, and the host of this show. Now, today I've got an exceptional guest with a fascinating story to match and super excited to have him on the podcast. Frank McKinney, often referred to as the daredevil developer, a real estate artist who built magnificent oceanfront homes for the ultra wealthy. He's also a six-time international best-selling author in five genres, a philanthro capitalist, ultra marathon runner, actor, and aspirational speaker. A true visionary, innovator, and creator in his own right. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Frank, and uh, thanks for being with us. Tak, tell me again, where are you coming to me from? Melbourne, Australia. Melbourne, Australia, okay. So I'm gonna spin the, the camera around real quick and show your viewers where I'm coming to them from. Oh, look that that now see that this is the scene or the site the location (laughs) for my very most recent and final masterpiece that i just finished right on the ocean in palm beach that is just absolutely awesome so take that in uh, listeners and viewers now frank the first thing i like to ask uh, all my guests for those who are not familiar with yourself is can you please give us a window into your background who you are and what was your first job well i'm just a corn-fed country boy from indiana i was born and raised in a small town called carmel indiana Mm -hmm. not carmel but carmel indiana (laughs) yeah i went to four high schools in four years because i was having challenges uh, staying focused. I was asked to leave every single one of the high schools until I graduated with a Mm -hmm. 1.8 grade point average. I didn't have the benefit of pursuing a formal education tack because of that grade point average. Mm -hmm. So I put everything in a duffel bag. I had a $50 bill. I threw that bag over my shoulder. I hopped on a plane from Indiana to Florida when I was 18 and landed and uh, started to pursue my professional, ultimately then my spiritual highest calling. Mm -hmm. So at 18 years old, there's nothing too spectacular about only having $50 to your name. You know, most 18 year olds have a little more, a little less than that. Mm -hmm. But I, I was able to do something that only happens a few times in life. And that is like, if you could imagine this being an eraser and I turned around to the chalkboard of my life and I erased what was, There was a reason I was in four high schools in four years. I spent seven different stints, seven seven different stays in juvenile detention. So I was was on a self-destructive path. Mm -hmm. Um, I needed a constructive outlet for a a very self-destructive tendency. Sigmund Freud says, and other noted psychiatrists say, we we really are who we are past the age of three. Some psychiatrists go all the way up to the age of 12. But after that, our core personalities are formed. So who I was and how I was behaving at age 16, 17, 18 was, gonna, was already established. It was how I was going to approach the rest of my life, like it or not. So when I landed in Florida and I had that chance to kind of erase the past and start fresh, I was around affluence, Tack. I was mm-hmm. around people who had money. It was very foreign to me coming from a corn, small little farm town in Indiana. And at 18, you can remember, and I'm sure your viewers can remember, you're very materialistic. You're very consumeristic. You're easily impressionable. So I wanted a piece of that lifestyle as a rich and famous. I had a, I got a job digging sand traps on a golf course. So I was basically maintaining the golf course. Mm -hmm. And Tech, I was around people who could play golf all day long. It, they never seemed to work. Mm-hmm. And that I, I was just, just infatuated by that lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Well, I went from the golf course to the tennis courts as a maintenance worker. Same people that were playing golf all day played tennis in the afternoon. 
How did they get here? Yeah. How did they have that free time? How did they have the beautiful mansion and the, and the, and the fancy car and the yacht and the beautiful wife? I wanted to know. And so I became a tennis instructor. It was my next job. Mm -hmm. And I picked the brain, brains of the ultra wealthy. After they were finished with their tennis lesson, and oftentimes I worked them so hard they couldn't finish their tennis lesson, I found out that most of their keys to success were real estate. And that's what I started to pursue when I was 21 years old. That's awesome. That's, that, that's an amazing story in itself, Frank. Now, you're known around the globe as the real estate artist. You know, you build homes with an average sale price of over 14 and a half million, all the way up to about 50 million. And for those who are listening, that's in USD. Now, can you please share for our listeners, what is a real estate artist? This is, there, there's going to be a handful of lessons I hope that people take mm -hmm. away. This is one that I hope that you will jot down. Regardless of the line of work that you're in, you don't have to be in real estate. I suggest, I encourage you to take an artist approach to your craft. So what does that mean? Yes, I'm a businessman. Of course, I'm a businessman. It needs to make sense. But I always appreciated somebody who could sing or play an instrument or, or paint or draw or sculpt. And I felt I'd like to do that too, only I don't have the skill to sing or, or sculpt or paint. What if I, I were to take what I, I, I was starting to get into, which was real estate back in the late 80s, even if it was a house worth less than $50,000 US, and I, were to, I was to create a piece of art, a three-dimensional piece of art, a beautiful piece, piece of art that somebody, instead of renting the American dream, could own the American dream. And Tack, if you were an artist, and if somebody's watching this, they are an artist, does an artist go to the art store and buy the cheapest palette to put their paint nice. in? Do they buy the cheapest watered down paint or the paintbrush that's made out of sheep's hair instead of camel hair? Do they buy an inexpensive canvas or cheap clay to sculpt or a secondhand instrument to play? No, they're very proud and passionate about that artistry. And so I decided that that was how I was gonna approach my real estate, is I was going to create now as I spun the camera around, you saw mm -hmm. this, is, this is artistry on a sun-drenched canvas yep. known as the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. And, and what it did and what it will do for your viewers is they'll learn that you build your reputation first, then the bottom line will follow. I was very keen on if I took an artist approach and I spent a little bit more money per square foot on my houses, that my reputation would build first and then my bottom line would follow shortly thereafter. Wow. Now I'm going to say, I think I've heard you said before as well, you built a lot on speculation and with your own money, you know, in a very super niche or niche category. And I mean, you're taking on some serious risks here. I mean, does risk and fear ever come into play or bother you? I mean, do you know what percentage of people that can actually, you know, afford your homes? So, well, I'll answer those two backwards. So the yep. percentage of people that can afford my house is, is about 40,000 people out of a worldwide population of 8 billion. So that's a point and then a zero and then seven more zeros mm. and then an 8% sign. It's infinitesimally yeah. small yeah. the number of people that can afford what I do for a living. Mm. The second big takeaway that I, I hope your viewers uh, will jot down is fear and risk. The pri if, if you only gave me two minutes to be on your program, I, and you asked me the, the one thing, the, if you were all, I was only allowed one thing to set, that, sets me, that has set me apart from most other entrepreneurs, especially people who are building speculative homes. And I would say how I approach fear. And I'm gonna tell you the best way that's worked for me and it can work for you because really as an entrepreneur, um, we feel fear every day of our life. I am afraid every day of my life. But when I realize that fear, the sensation, remember fear is a gift, it's a sensation that was given to us by God. When we feel fear, that fear is always associated with the thought, just the thought of taking a risk, not the actual taking of the risk. I'm gonna give you a very simple example. Yep. You're on a roller coaster and, and that metal bar 
locks you mm -hmm. in and and the, and the and the mechanism releases the car and it starts to go up the hill for the first time and it makes that click giddy clack giddy click 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 it's going up you're looking down on both sides and you're realizing the earth is getting further away and your heart is pounding mm -hmm. your fear is beginning to peak yeah. it's the thought of what's about to happen that causes that sensation of fear because why because you're you're thinking about that risk that's about to come what happens tack once the roller coaster goes over the crest of the top of the hill and starts going downhill that fear is gone it's replaced and this is the same thing in business it's replaced with joy with excitement and when that rides over what do we do we get in the back of the line and we do it over again hmm. so when when i tell you that i'm afraid every day of my life I embrace fear. Fear is not to be conquered. Fear is not to be, uh, you know, purged from our system. It's, it's, it, it, when I realize I'm afraid, that means I'm, I'm about ready to take a big risk. And what is risk always associated with in life? Almost always a big change or a big challenge. It could be financial, spiritual, dietary, relational, you name it. Big change or big challenge, if we want it, we're going to have to risk. And if we're going to risk, we've got to associate that fear with the thought, the thought, only the thought of taking the risk. Once you take the risk, the fear dissipates. So, so Tack, back to the fact that I'm afraid every day. The difference is I don't let it stop me. I don't let the fear stop me. I embrace it. I realize it's associated with the risk, which is a big change or a big challenge in my life. And I say yes more than no to the opportunity wow just remember that one listeners just uh, go back and re-listen to it to totally i mean just going back a little bit frank you know what actually made you decide to go super high end you know what was your thought process was it from you know when you were teaching tennis and you're seeing all these ultra wealthy people when they're in the supercars and you know everything well, that's a good question. I don't think I've ever been asked that one before. I, for the first five years of my real estate career tech, I didn't do a house worth more than a hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Okay. So think about that. that that's five years. It, there, there's, there's a wonderful art, uh, author out there by the name of Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, yes. Malcolm Gladwell, you, you're familiar with the art, yes. with the author yeah. in the book Blink. He mm -hmm. wrote a book, a beautiful book called Blink. I read it maybe five summers ago and I realized he references to be an expert at anything in life, you have to put in five years, 10,000 hours, same thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, so my first renovation I did was, was in the, the late 80s, and for five years, I didn't do a house worth more than $100,000. What did I do? I became an expert at the craft of real estate. And then when I had the confidence, I went from a $100,000 fixer upper flip house mm -hmm. to a $2.2 .2 million house. Nothing in between. So that's a big <laughs> yeah. Well, what I learned, what I realized from some of the people I was teaching tennis to, yes, was there's two segments of the real estate marketplace that are relatively recession proof. Yeah. The first time home buyer, which is who I was selling to for five years, and the ultra wealthy. Both of those classes of real estate buyer have been around since the Roman era and probably since the caveman era. They've been around forever. And so jumping up to the, to the higher end, and by the way, $2.2 .2 million house back in 1992 was a very expensive house. In, in Florida, it's, not, it's nothing now, but it was a lot back then. And so I encourage people to, you can make a really good living at that first time home buyer price point, whatever it is in Australia or throughout the world. But I, when it comes to quality of life, like I was doing 20 houses or so a year and it, it was very stressful. Uh, when I jumped, we've only done 40 some houses since 1992. That's 28 years, 40 houses. 40 houses sounds like a lot, but over 28 years, it's really not. So I, I'm, I'm, I was and still am monomaniacally focused. Mono, look up monomaniacal. Monomaniacally focused on carving my niche a little deeper and a little wider than most at a price point where I can be considered the expert. I can be considered one of the best in the world at what I do in this price point. And that allows you to, to what? To dominate and create a brand. 
And that's why I, I've, I've stayed only at that high end level for the last okay. 28 years. Awesome. Interesting. Interesting. Just want to talk about marketing a little bit, Frank. You know, I'm trying to learn from an expert such as yourself, and I also believe, you know, it will benefit uh, our listeners immensely. You know, playing in a super niche uh, category in, in your case, now, how do you decide and approach how you market so it reaches, you know, the correct audience instead of just tire kickers, so-called? I mean, there isn't a lot of people that can afford what you're building. So what's your strategy there? Okay, so th this is th this is going to apply to the person who's not even into real estate, mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll give them a little bit more real estate specific. Personal branding is the art of amplifying your essence mm -hmm. to the point where your customers, either current or future, become subliminally intoxicated with you first, then your product or service. Okay. I'm going to say it again: personal branding is the art of amplifying your essence. In other words, what sets you apart, what really amplify, what, what, what makes you different. You, you do this to the point where your customers, either current or future, if you're just getting into business, become subconsciously, subliminally intoxicated with you first, then your product or service. Because let's, let's face it, we're not Apple, we're not Coca-Cola, we're not Pepsi, we're not Tesla, we're not Kleenex. We're individual brands before we become, become anything else. And so I worked very hard on my personal brand from a very young age. And even when I was doing the $100,000 houses. And then I, I said, okay, well, part of that brand is, is to make sure that we put on very theatrical, uh, very over the top Broadway, Las Vegas esque type type brand unveilings for our houses, and you can go to to my website at frank mckinneycom or just follow me on Instagram at the Frank McKinney, and you can see some of that. And and so the the idea really, you, you hit the nail on the head, Tack. There's there's only forty thousand people that can afford what I do, so I've got to get the word out to them, and and by by starting with these very theatrical unveilings. And, and in my book, Burst This, for those of you who are into real estate, this is pretty much everything that I know in real estate. I have a, a, a whole section, that it's a 100-page it's a section that's dedicated to just marketing. Because if you overpay, okay. If you overimprove your property, all right, whatever. But marketing is what will set you apart. So I have 147 different initiatives that I touch on a regular basis in order to make sure that my property is in front of that small percentage of people that, that can afford it. Yep. And, and maybe some of it is a little bit uh, over the top, a little bit, little bit too bombastic, a little bit too theatrical. Mm -hmm. But I don't come with the house. The shirt doesn't come with the house. The hairstyle doesn't come with the house. It's in business, you, you must come across uh, to, to get the attention for your product or service as nine or 80% uh, sizzle, 20% substance. But behind those, the, the true reality, when you flip that around, when you walk in the front door of one of my houses, Tack, mm -hmm. it's 80% it's substance and maybe 20% sizzle. And, and that, that, that sizzle is what gets the attention. Of course, I associate with very high-end real estate brokers, million-dollar producers. My property is listed with, with a, a real estate company that, that has a worldwide attention, Corcoran International. So, I mean, but, 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 but I... You know, not everybody's going to be at that level. I want you to work on your personal brand first, yeah. amplifying and accentuating your essence, what sets you apart. That will start to help you establish that personal brand. Just got the uh, got my creative juices thinking now. That's and that's great. Now you seem to be able to set things up over and over again, Frank. You know, whether it be reinventing yourself on a personal level or creating a new masterpiece, you know, where does your ideas, creativity and drive come from? So it's very, very simple. Uh, it's, it's ingenuity and creativity that is rewarded in business today. So that being a fact, when I came into the business world out of, you know, I came down from Indiana and I started teaching tennis, I was taught and I was, I was made to believe that I was right brain dominant, meaning I was an analytical individual. Mm -hmm that I was a business minded individual, that I had no creative talent whatsoever. And, and eventually, most people that I talk to, are you a creative 
Are you a visionary? Are you a spreadsheet and a business minded individual? Most people would answer that very quickly and they'll say, oh, you know what? I, I take care of the books and I take care of the, the business app and my partner is the creative. Yeah. Th that's, a, that's, that's very negative self-talk. So when I came down, my, my grandfather was a banker, Tech. My father was a banker. I was supposed to be a banker. And, I, and so I was very right brain dominant. I realized, no, I want to be creative. You know, it took me about 10 years to awaken the left side of my brain so that I could be creative. Yep. And I realized that the people that I looked up to, some of these people I taught tennis to, and also people that I read about in the newspaper mm -hmm. or watched on television that were trendsetters. I mean, even back in the day when, when Bill Gates was at the beginning of his career and I watched Steve Jobs' career, now and more recently you watch Elon Musk's career, mm. it's creativity and ingenuity. It's, and you got, you, the business, it's gonna make business sense before you pursue it. Mm -hmm. So I, I awoken, I stimulated the left side, so now I'm able to toggle back and forth between right brain, left brain. Does it make sense to build this house on the ocean that I just showed you? Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and believe me, I do the spreadsheets and I crunch the numbers. And once it does, I kind of turn that side off and, and run quickly and spend a lot, of time, a lot of time on the left side of the brain. Yeah. To, to successfully do that, it's really important you create an environment that allows you to drown out the negativity. And I'll tell you what, it's tougher than ever nowadays. So yeah. uh, in, in uh, 18 years ago, I built a tree house. This is gonna sound odd, but I built a tree house. I'm not coming to you from there today. I wanted to show you where I am now, but I work out of a tree house. Tree My house. office is in a tree house. It's got 20, win oh, no, it's got no, 12 windows. It's 22 feet above sea level. It has a bathroom, a sink, a shower. It's surrounded by this beautiful sea grape tree. Mm -hmm. Looks at the ocean. That environment, tack, it, it, Everybody that works for me works from home. So one, two, three, four, five, six books in five different genres. Tech, I hadn't written a book until I built that treehouse. What it did was create an environment that, that drew out creativity and ingenuity. Yeah. So create that space for yourself. You might not be able to build a tree house, mm -hmm. but create some space where you can allow that creativity and ingenuity to flow. Because if you're an entrepreneur, that's the, that's the only way you're going to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Noted. Noted. Now I want to touch on uh, spirituality briefly. Now you've written a book about it. Uh, I think you showed it just now, uh, the tap. Now for me, it's something, yeah, that's the one. Now, for me, it's something that my wife, Hoping, and I personally have been learning, reading, and getting deeper into the last two years. I mean, there's a lot of people think that it's, you know, it's a bit woo-woo, but I mean, that, that's totally fine. I mean, what are your thoughts on it helping and leading to success in both business and life? Sharpen your pencil, folks, because this is, if, if you're watching this program, any, any, any program where you're trying to learn and better yourself. Mm -hmm. The purpose behind you watching the program, if I were to ask you, why are you watching tax program? And I'd get a few topical answers. Eventually I would get, Frank, quit asking me the question, I just wanna be happy. Oh, you, oh, okay, right, we all just wanna be happy. So what I've learned is, and I, I was at a very low point tack in my mid thirties. I had, I had all the success in the world. I had built the most expensive spec house in the history of Palm Beach County at the time. It's, the record's since been eclipsed, but at the time I had the record. I had lost all heart in my soul. I was so materialistic. I was so consumeristic. I was so focused on more clothes in my closet and cars in my garage and food in my pantry than I was soul in my heart. And I was depressed. I'm, I'm coming from Indiana with a $50 bill and I'm, I'm at the top of the ladder as far as I'm concerned. And I feel like I'm going to say one bad word the whole day. I feel like shit. I feel terrible. And I realized that my whole life I had been pursuing my professional highest calling. Everybody has one. Mm -hmm. It's what you do to put food on the table and you do it a little bit better than most. That's God's gift to you professionally. Yep. Everybody has a spiritual highest calling as well, Tack. I didn't know that. I had no idea that's why I was hurting so bad in my, my heart, my soul, yeah. is because I had sold my soul for success. 
And I realized, wait a minute, you, you have a 1.8 grade point average. You, you, you've succeeded. You've been given a lot. And there's a passage in the Bible. And if you're not in the Bible, don't let this freak you out. It's a good life. It's a great life mantra. To whom much is entrusted, much is required. To whom much is given, much is expected. So wait a second. Now, I've been given a lot. I've been given a lot of blessings that, that I certainly didn't deserve. Shouldn't I be sharing those with those less fortunate? And so the whole concept behind the book, The Tap, was you can see this is a painting from the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo's painting, the hand of God come, coming down. And I took Adam out of the picture and put you, the reader, in the picture to recognize life's great tap moments when God comes down and taps you on the shoulder, yes. not to brush it off, and mm -hmm. to pursue those life great, life's great tap moments. Tack, when I realized that I could be building, not could be, have been building villages in Haiti now for 17 years mm -hmm. in the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, not for profit, we're building these villages by giving 12,400 children now a self-sustaining existence. Housing, food, water, schools, clinic, community centers, churches in a self-contained villages village. I have built, or we have built, our caring house has built 27 villages. So I am in the business of building these beautiful big houses so we can go to Haiti and build a bunch of little tiny houses in these villages and give them to those less fortunate. Once I was able to put together my spiritual highest calling mm -hmm. with my professional highest calling, that pretty much allows you to skip over happiness and land on joy. Mm -hmm. Wow. Powerful, powerful stuff. Now, in your opinion, Frank, why people don't succeed? I mean, you've been around the block, achieved a lot of success. In your view, what's the difference from someone, you know, that is successful to someone that who say who's not? Are there any particular traits that you see? Yeah, there's a few. I'll, I'll give you two. Mm -hmm. One, I'm just going to repeat it again, that ability to embrace risk. That, that is probably the most important thing is to, is to be able to embrace risk regardless of the sensation of fear. Go back and listen to that again if you want to hear mm -hmm. why, but I'm not going to repeat that. That, that is one. Number two, uh, if you picture the hands on a clock from 12, 3, 6, 9, and, and 12 again, uh, what I find in business is you're one of four types of people. Mm -hmm. we, we get excited about an endeavor, and let's say that's right at 12 o'clock. We're going to use just the second hand, okay? At 12 o'clock, we get excited. That second hand starts to move, tick, tick, tick. At 3 o'clock, because our attention spans are too short, we, like a flea, jump from one endeavor to the next. If it was real estate, it would be, mm -hmm. I'm excited about being a real estate investor. And, and by the time it's three o'clock, should I be a short seller, a wholesaler, a retailer, a builder, a, a buying property from the bank, uh, owning storage units? And we keep, like a flea jumps from one animal to the next. We, we, we don't have the attention span to stick with something past three o'clock. So I call that person, what? A flea. You can't stay focused long enough. Let's say you passed three o'clock and you got over the temptation to jump from one business to the next because you didn't see returns in the, next, in the first you know, two days. Then the clock comes down to six o'clock. Now at six o'clock, that's when the, drud the drudgery sets in. That's when my house is under construction tack and there's no plumbing here and I show up on a Saturday and somebody took a crap in the toilet. Okay, I can't flush the toilet. There's no running water yet. And yet I have to take a bucket and go out to the ocean and clean out a toilet. Are you kidding me? I used to be a tennis instructor holding beautiful women around the waist, making $100,000 a year. I gave up all that to clean crap out of a toilet. I hate this business. I'm not ever coming back to it again. I, at the halfway point, I quit. All right, so let's do it again. You're not a flea. You got to the halfway point because it's too hard and you quit. To me, you're not a flea, you're a half-asser. You are a half-asser. You do things halfway and then you bail. Out of a calendar year tech, there's 365 days. I work 355 days for 10 what I call extraordinarily golden days. So I bust my ass 355 days for the 10 days that are extraordinarily golden. 
I got to work past that crap in the toilet or whatever the drudgery is in your business. So, okay, you move past the flea, you get past that low point in your career. Now you're at nine o'clock. You're almost there. You can, you can see the finish line. Now this only happens to about 20% of the people, but I want you to be aware of this. You become or have become too associated with the process of making money. The process, in my case, would be the process of build marketing and building a house. For a, 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 an everyday example, it would be like a woman who got divorced five years ago and all she can do is complain about men and how horrible things are. She's associated with the process of divorce. She has not moved on. That person in business, not a flea, not a half-asser, that person is so enamored with process, they forget the reason they got into the business in the first place, and they are subconsciously afraid of success. They're afraid that, oh my God, what happens if I finish? What am I gonna do? I, I'm so enamored with the process of building and marketing. What am I gonna do with myself? It's my identity now. No, 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 no. You, you and only, again, 15 to 20% of the people quit here because they're afraid of success and they start all over again. Don't do that. Become what I am and what sets people apart. In a word, an executioner. You are an executioner. So you're not a flea, you're not a half-asser, you don't, you're not afraid of success. You're going to close the loop on whatever it is that you started. And notice I said it was 12, 3, 6, 9. Whatever it is that you start, I encourage you to give it a year. At three months, your attention span goes away. At six months, oh my God, I'm cleaning crap out of the toilet again. At nine months, I'm almost there. What am I going to do with myself when this is over? Be the executioner. Close the loop on something you started. And if it means a lot to you and you're passionate about it, give it a year. Wow, that's gold. That's gold. Yeah, Frank, I just want to quickly be um, go back to your fantastic foundation. You know, you talked about the Caring House project where you built like self-sufficient villages. Now, that's totally fantastic. Can you please tell us a little bit more about it? And what is a self-sufficient village? I mean, how, how did you start it? And what's your mission for it okay so in a word it's a word that i made up um i'm a philanthro capitalist mm. so i take the best of philanthropy and the best of capitalism because tack charity exacerbates poverty that's a big word mm. for it. charity makes poverty worse in my country i can look at what the entitlement mentality the welfare mentality has done to a whole class of our citizens. There's a difference between a welfare system and an entitlement program. Those are well-meaning. They were, they were invented in our country at, back in the Great Depression. Very well-meaning to pull you up by the bootstraps and then get you on your way. But what's very toxic is the mentality. And with all the government programs, you know, with COVID now, it's creating a whole new class of people who feel entitled mm. to their unemployment and they just don't want to go back to work. Yep. So what I did in, in Haiti, because I didn't want to see that happen in Haiti, there is no government program to help the indigent in the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. We, just like you are, led with entrepreneurship as the solution to poverty. Mm -hmm. So... Every one of our villages, when I say self-sufficient, mm -hmm. I'm going I'm to frame an average village. 40 houses, a community center. Inside that community center is a school, a church, and a clinic. Renewable food. So it's, it's renewing itself. Clean drinking water. And the most important element, some form of free enterprise. Meaning, every village, we leave with maybe an animal husbandry, uh, a nursery, a fishing cooperative. We've done a number of fishing cooperatives. Even something as simple as leaving the village with two dozen sewing machines so the women can make textiles and sell them. Yeah. So when I leave, when our caring house leaves, they know before we even get there, Tech, I'm not coming back to help you. There's no more assistance once the village is built. 
It, you must be self-sufficient. We provided the elements for you to be self-sufficient. I go back to the first village we did 17 years ago and it's thriving. It's thriving. It may not be as pretty, but it's thriving. So, so, so that model, that philanthrocapitalistic model mm -hmm. is something that we have shared with other much larger organizations than ours. And, and in business, because remember, I'm taking a business approach to solving poverty. In business, you have an ROI. We all know what an ROI is, mm -hmm. return on investment. We coined the phrase ROD, return on donation. How far can I stretch my donor's dollar? I'll give you a very simple example. I can build a concrete house for a family of eight for $4,800. Wow. Concrete house. Now, it's not much. I mean, it's tiny. It's, you know, 500 square feet. But for $4,800, this family was living in a mud shack with palm fronds for a roof, dirt floors with roads the size of cats running across them. Mm. And now they've got a hurricane-proof, earthquake-resistant concrete house for $4,800. That's wow. return on donation. Wow, that's awesome. Now, just quickly, for those who want to learn more about it, uh, your foundation help or maybe even donate, where, where can they go? You know, the, the thing to do, I would suggest, and, and maybe some people are still, you know, sheltering in place and mm. staying home or what have you, or even if you're not and you're out. If you want to go to Disney, uh, go to my website. It's really like going Disney. to a stationary <laughs> Disney World. So it's just my name, Frank hyphen mckinney.com i'm sure tack will put up a link frank dash put it up yeah at that website you can go to haiti you can see the 27 villages that we've built i have 78 different donation options that range from a four dollars and 75 cent chicken so give up a, a cup of coffee one day and, and donate to buy a chicken by the way the haitians don't eat the chickens they lay eggs for two and a half year two to two and a half years before the so they're eating the eggs for two and a half. Yeah. then they eat the chicken when it doesn't yeah. give, give up eggs so $4.75 all the way up to a $285,000 village. Mm. You can see, take tours of a house like this. I mean, you can go through these fantastic houses that I've built. If you're interested in any one of the six books, there's, there's sample chapters you can read. Mm -hmm. So it, it is kind of, it wasn't my phrase. Somebody else said, Frank, it's almost like going to Disney at my <laughs> desk when I go to your website. I'd encourage you to go there. And yes, as Tech just mentioned, um, you know, we can stretch your dollar quite far in Haiti. So if you do have some altruism running through your veins and you know that we've been around for, for almost, well, we have been around, Caring House has been around for 20 years, help us provide the self-sustaining existence in Haiti. It's not, it's not charity, it's self-sufficiency. And we know how to responsibly implement your donation. No, awesome. I'll definitely put it up, Frank. Um, now, moving on from that, your work ethic, you know, is simply impeccable. Can you please share with our listeners, you know, what do you think has been your biggest challenge or improvement to date? You know, has it been all rainbows and unicorns? No, here's, 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 uh, I'm, I'm going to try to, you know, I try to give everybody the shortcut, mm. um, the, the, you know, to learn from my, my mistakes. So in my very first book, Make It Big, uh, so it's a few hairstyles ago. Look at that. <laughs> Uh, I, that book came out, you know, almost 18 years ago. I talk about taking the lunch pail approach. So it, it might be something that isn't familiar in, in, in Australia and other places, but a lunch pail is basically a, you know, a, a, a box that you, that workers put their lunch in and they pack it and they go to work. And because I had no education and I just didn't have any connections or network or funding or friends, I figured, you know what, I'm just going to show up every day. I'm gonna pack my lunch box, I'm gonna pack my lunch pail and show up day in and day out. And in, in the United States, actually one of the seven wonders of the, of the world is Mount Rushmore. And Mount Rushmore was, was sculpted by a gentleman by the name of Gutzen Borglum. Gutzen Borglum packed his lunch pail every single day. Matter of fact, he died just before it was finished. But do you think that on day one, let alone day 101 that he could see any progress in the sculpting of Mount Rushmore, the four presidents that are on Mount Rushmore, he couldn't see a thing. You couldn't make out the nose on George Washington. But over time, by taking that lunch pail approach and showing up day in and day out, his overnight success took 17 years from the time he hit that chisel for the first time to the time that they pulled the veil off of the four presidents. 
my overnight success, probably 20 years. So I, I, I'm kind of put off by the saying, you know, work smarter, not harder. What if you did both? What if you worked smarter and you worked harder? Think of the results. That's what I have done. And, and, and don't, don't get me wrong. I, I, I take time off. I, 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 I recharge my battery. I get away from the, the, the world. For, for matter of fact, I, I've written a lot of my books while I was just you know, tuned out. Mm. Um, and, and I really, and I have failed a number of times at personal in, endeavors as well as in real estate. There's some projects I didn't make any money on. But you better believe I do what I call a post-mortem on that failure. Post-mortem. It's dead. Okay, so it is dead. It's over. I'm not going to dwell on it, but I am going to go like a, like a pathologist. I'm going to go back like a mortician, and I'm going to do that post-mortem to find out why I failed so I don't fail, so I don't fail that way again. But I probably will fail again. Mm -hmm. Now, out of interest, Frank, you know, do you think in your mind, you know, with all the hard work and everything that you've done, do you think in this particular moment you should be worth more than you are now or you're exactly where you should be? I think I, I, I pray every night when my head hits the pillow, pillow that my, um, my soul's worth, my, my, um, my worth in heaven, my, my worth to God, yeah, I, I wish that was worth more. I try every day to be a better human so that my, my self – not my sense of self-worth, but my, my, my worth as a human being to the world is more valuable. And that, you can always better your previous best. And, and in my case, I feel like I'm still working on that part. I don't care about the net worth, the financial net worth. That'll drive a person mad if, if you think that you're, you should be worth more money. I, I, I will tell you a very simple exercise that I've done for maybe 25 years that I learned from my father, a simple balance sheet, assets minus liabilities equals net worth, a personal financial statement. My dad taught me how to fill it out back when I was in my early 20s, and I fill that out every year to see what am I worth? What's, what is my net worth? Because it doesn't matter how much we make, does it, Tack? It matters how much we keep. Yeah, and so exactly. my my net worth has averaged an increase of about 125 to 13% a year over that 25 year span. Mm -hmm. There's been years I've doubled my net worth. And there was years back in 2010 and 11 when the, yeah. you know, the market crashed mm -hmm. here that my net worth was cut in half. But I do that exercise at the end of every year to see how much am I making by investing in myself? Because that's really what I do. I take the money, I build a piece of property, but I'm investing in my belief that this oceanfront home will, will soon sell, which it's mm -hmm. going to, I don't know when your program's going to air, but this house will be sold when it airs. Yep. Gone. I won't be able to even do a broadcast from here. It's probably the last broadcast I can do from here. So I, I, don't, I want people to focus on, on, on the spiritual net worth mm -hmm. because that's where your joy is found. Yep. It won't be found in the bank account. Now, once you start to make money, Remember, you've got the three T's in the Bible, time, talent, and treasure. From, from this moment forward, you should be sharing your time with those less fortunate if you have no talent or no treasure. Once you have some talent, share that with those less fortunate. And then ultimately, as we do when we sell a house, we go and build another village in Haiti by sharing our treasure. Awesome. Awesome. Now, we've got an audience from over 90 countries, uh, Frank, you know, listening and watching. In interesting times like this, you know, with the COVID, what would your advice or message be for our listeners? You know, what should people be doing right now so they can come out when, you know, back to the new normal, they can come out punching? Well, first of all, I mean, if you would have asked me that three months ago when we were at the height of COVID or two months ago, mm -hmm. my answer would be different than now. The answer back then was, because I, I did do a few interviews back then, was the world spins at at a thousand miles per hour on its axis. That is a fact, mm -hmm. a scientific fact. So as it spins at a thousand miles per hour, it came to a complete stop. The, the world came to a complete stop. Maybe one more up here. Oh. <laughs> it came to a complete stop. What are you doing with your time when the world has come to a complete stop? And th that was a time for me when in the middle of COVID, you know what I did? I took out old um, journals 
Yeah. And I started reading back how I was thinking a year ago, two years ago. And I was looking for progress that I had made. And I was also looking for, Frank, you're still doing that. You're still making that mistake. You're still in that cycle. So I did kind of a little post-mortem almost on my life during that point. I, now that a lot of things are starting to thaw out and people yeah. are starting to get out. And especially, I think, how's Australia doing, by the way? Uh, we're doing okay, but... Uh... In, in Victoria, where I am in Melbourne, uh, the cases have increased. So it looks like we, the, the borders are still closed. Borders are closed. Are you yeah. stay at home? Are you still a stay at home orders or? Uh, no, no, we can go to work. If, I mean, we can go to the office if you want to, but um, yeah, they're, they're reviewing it at the moment because there has been a sudden, sudden Spike. jump a couple of days. Yeah. Right. But you, are you able to go to restaurants? Are you able to yes, go to the gym? Yes. You can yes. do all that. Yes. Okay. So, so what I what I caution people about, uh, because you're listening to too much television and, and watching too much media, is this buy, don't buy into this new normal. Uh, that's a bit of a brainwash, and I don't I don't buy it. I, I don't want the new normal. I want a more frequent extraordinary. Mm -hmm. I don't want a new normal. I want a more frequent extraordinary. So yes, we all got to hit the reset button, yep. uh, and if that reset button was hit, it's it's. Why should anything be normal? I mean, a new normal, that's an oxymoron. Those don't even go together. Yeah. It, 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 a more frequent, extraordinary. So, so maybe, you know, we started the, your program with the eraser. And I went mm -hmm. back and, and, and I erased the things in my life that I didn't like. Well, what about using this opportunity of COVID to do the same thing? Mm -hmm. and, and, to, and to hit the reset, to hit reinvent. You know, as I mentioned at the beginning of your program, this is my final masterpiece. As soon as it sells, I'm moving it, I'm shifting and I'm reinventing in a different direction. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, a, I, I don't know what it is because I, I remember monomaniacally focused. I stay extremely focused. I don't want to be distracted outside of my niche until it's time. I don't allow that. I'm very disciplined that way. So, so don't buy the new normal. Don't buy the brainwash. I think it's very important. The, 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 the solution or the, the cure, the, mm -hmm. the antidote, the vaccine to COVID is taking your television and throwing it in the trash. <laughs> I mean, really, it'll it'll help. It'll help you over a lot of things, and and don't allow, don't allow somebody else, especially another entity like the media, to create your reality for you. Yeah. You must yeah. create your own reality. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that I work from a treehouse tack because I get to create my own reality from up there. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. Now, Frank, if you could have a billboard with anything on it, what would it be and why? Oh, I think it would be t two statements. What one would be exercise your risk tolerance like a muscle. Eventually, it will become stronger and able to withstand greater pressure. I, I think I'm 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 saddened by more people not embracing risk. And you don't have to be in business, by the way. I mean, mm -hmm. life is about taking a risk to enjoy it. So I'd have I'd have I'd have a, a reference to risk on the billboard, and I'd also have a reference to that passage from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verse 48, that says, to whom much is entrusted, much is required. God rewards oh. responsible stewards, Tack. When mm. you're a responsible steward for the blessings God's given you, your territory is enlarged. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I just wish more people would read that part of the billboard. Awesome, awesome. Now, we'll have to work towards uh, wrapping up and super mindful of your time, Frank. You know, fantastic shares and words of wisdom. Really appreciate your transparency, authenticity, and willingness to openly share. Just got two last questions. Um, first is, where can people find out more about yourself and, again, your foundation? Uh, well, before I answer that, you just brought up something I want to I, I want to mention. Sure. I want to add one more yeah. acronym. Please. Sure. So, in business, mm. in your family life, in your marketing, in your spiritual life. In the United States, and maybe it's the, the, the same in these other 89 countries, there is a, there is a, uh, a, a vehicle that's, that's known as an all-terrain vehicle. All-terrain vehicle. You've heard this acronym? You've heard this before. Okay, an all-terrain vehicle. If I ask you, what is the acronym for an all-terrain vehicle? It's an ATV. I'm going to go ride my ATV today. All-terrain vehicle. ATV. Yeah authenticity transparency vulnerability atv those three things this is this is somewhat new to my world 
I would say my approach to my world in the last three to five years mm -hmm. that I'm much more authentic and I really try to be more transparent and, and especially when you're influencing a lot of people like I do through my books and when I give presentations, when we're able to get back on the stage, mm -hmm. being more vulnerable, showing our failures, showing our fears, yeah. uh, that is something, and, and I do it in my marketing too, by the way. I, I'm very authentic, transparent, and vulnerable. So remember the all-terrain vehicle, the ATV, ATV, as you go throughout your, yes, as you mm -hmm. go throughout your day. Again, to learn more about the, the ATV and anything else for that matter, go to, go to Disney, otherwise known as frank-mckinney.com. Um, follow me on, on Instagram. I'm using Instagram a lot more, Tech. I'm, I'm yeah. really using that. I like the pictorial platform. Mm. Uh, so it's just the Frank McKinney on Instagram where you can oh, see the houses well. I built yeah. in Haiti and all that. It's, you, you follow me. Yep. I'm pretty transparent on, on, on Instagram mm. as well. Yeah. Uh, so that's where, you can, that's where you can find me. Awesome. And uh, lastly, any parting words of uh, wisdom for our listeners? Oh boy, we covered it, didn't we? Yeah, I mean, let's yeah, get we out there and risk. Let's not let fear stop us. Let's share our mm -hmm. blessings with those less fortunate. Yep. And let's go out and build, build a personal brand that intoxicates your customers. Awesome. They're totally incredible insights, learnings, and, uh, and knowledge. Thanks again, Frank. And I uh, really appreciate your time. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Frank. So, all right, guys, hope you've enjoyed this interview. You can find me on social media at iam.tackley and also at live turn next. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the next episode. YOLO, YOLO, it's our show. Oh, oh, there's one thing we know with all our cargo. It's turn next, our hero.